Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi everyone, it's Tuesday night, and that means it is time for Friends in Fiction. And I cannot tell you how excited I am about tonight and our guest, Paula McLean. We have so much to look forward to. I am Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. And this is Friends in Fiction, New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores. Tonight, you are the luckiest because you get to meet Paula McLean. Her new book, When the Stars Go Dark, was an instant New York Times bestseller. We'll be hearing about this novel, her totally fascinating research, and the inspiration behind this book. We'll talk about how she started as a poet and a memoirist, and we will definitely talk about her profile in the New York Times and the very personal nature of this novel. And of course, for all of you who show up for this, we will not let her get away without a writing tip. And um, we just wanted to stop right now and say thanks to all of you who came to our musical last week <laughs> that our brilliant Kristen Harmel wrote and um, we semi-performed. It was amazing. <laughs> and um, Kristen, you can probably tell, is in a hotel room right now. I she am. is having a very busy week back on tour for the, the first time since before yeah. COVID. Right? So yeah. how is it going? Like, well, first of all, we want to raise a, t a toast to oh. you. To you, you this extraordinary <laughs> new book. Cheers. Thank you. We're so Thank proud you. of you. Um, and how is tour going? It's been amazing. Um, I've, I've gotten to meet so many Friends in Fiction members, and it's been so, um, gosh, just amazing to have people come up and say what Friends in Fiction has meant to them, mm -hmm. to say what, you know, some one of my books has meant to them. Um, that's been incredible. I get to give... Um, Lisa from our book club, a huge hug last night. I get to give Anissa a big hug today. Um, it's just so nice to be um, connecting in person with people again. And, you know, Kathy and I, uh, Mary Kay Andrews and I did an event together at Foxtail last night. And just to see the number of people who came in and told us both that, um, that Friends in Fiction meant something to them. Um, it, it just makes all of this worthwhile. It, it, it meant, I think it meant so much to both of us. That's awesome. Yeah. I was there last night and um, it was so gratifying. I mean, I was just sort of a fly on the wall, but it was so gratifying oh. to see so many friends and fiction members and people had tears in their eyes because they were so glad to see Kristen in person. And so many shared their amazing stories and they were deeply touched and inspired by um, the forest of vanishing stars. So Thank you. I mean, it was so it was it was really a privilege for me to Thank see well, that. Me too. Thank you. First. Thank you for well, saying. That. I just feel like y'all are all being a little bit braggy since I'm the only one that doesn't get to see Kristen in person until <laughs> August. And so I'm gonna have tears in my eyes when I see you too, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right, you guys. I get to see I, you I, on I, Sunday. So, I know. Yep. I'm so excited about it. I might think I'm actually picking you up uh, from the airport on my yeah, on, on Saturday. Saturday. I, I can't wait. All right. Yeah. And speaking of sales, you guys, speaking of all everything we're doing with these independent bookstores, these bookstores we're going on the road and visiting all of us um, in our continuing support of indie bookstores. Tonight, our bookstore of the week is Loganberry Books in the historic Larchmere. I might be saying it wrong. Neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. And apologies if I've said the neighborhood name wrong. But established in 1994, they feature a carefully curated collection of new, used and rare books. So we'll be telling you about them in just a little bit. 
And of course, we are always so grateful to our sponsor, Mama Geraldine's, a woman-run business with the most delicious cheese straws and cookies. It's been a mainstay for us here at Friends in Fiction and for our families. And you get 20% off with the code FAB5. Yay! And today we celebrated, ladies, our 50th oh, issue of the newsletter. How is that possible? Is that <laughs> that that for 50 possible? Issues? And we wow. have surpassed yeah. over 7,000 subscribers. So I've seen we've seen a lot of y'all lately saying, oh, I've missed events. How do I find them? If you subscribe to the newsletter, yeah. you'll get everything you've ever wanted to know. Yeah, the link is everything, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yep. exactly right. And drum roll. That was a broad <laughs> one. We don't let Patty do sound effects anymore, but maybe we shouldn't let me do them either. That wasn't very good. I should have done that all of our time. But we have a huge announcement. We're so excited. We've been keeping a teeny tiny bit of a secret, and we're here to tell you about it tonight. You know that Mary Kay, Patty, and I all have fall books coming out in September and October. Guess what? <laughs> Back by popular demand, we have a Friends and Fiction signed first edition subscription. A winter, if you will, a winter wonderland of wonderful wooks. Wait, no, I said whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> winter wonderland of wonderful books. And we are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Nantucket Book Partners for a chock full of fun package. So if you subscribe to the package, which has Mary Kay Andrews, The Santa Suit, My Once Upon a Wardrobe, and oh. Christie's Christmas and Peachtree Bluff. If you subscribe to the package, you will receive signed first editions the day they come out of each book. But also, look at that adorable mug and exclusive friends and fiction mug. I love it. So, it's I want one. Too. It's a big, <laughs> it's like a big chunky like a, wrap your hands around it kind of. We might have um, spent a very long time picking that one out. An embarrassingly, an embarrassing <laughs> number of texts. That's right. It's beautiful because if, if anything, if anything can be overthunk, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, <will> overthink <laughs> we are here for it. Yes. So and also, along with that, you get the bamboo steamer. No, you get <laughs> <laughs> an extra set of Ginsu knives. <laughs> And a head scratcher. <laughs> yeah, you do yeah. not. With each book, you're going to receive an exclusive book club kit from each of us with the recipe, discussion questions, and other interesting content. And to add to the fun, the three of us sat down. We were in Beaufort, and we filmed an exclusive chat about the behind-the-scenes story secrets of these novels that you will not see anywhere else. So with this package, you'll receive a code to watch the interview with us that only subscribers to the Winter Wonderland can watch. So we'll post about it after the show tonight, and all the details will be on our Facebook page. You know that every week we partner with Parade Magazine Online. We stream from their Facebook page, and we have an original essay in their online magazine every week. This week, our Mary Kay Andrews wrote about running away from home to write. You can find it on Parade's website or on our Facebook page. But in the meantime, Mary Kay, can you tell us a little bit about it? I would love to. You know, um, really, since the beginning of my fiction career, I've been doing just that, running away from home to write. Um, when I first started, I had little kids and I would just leave my husband with some takeout menus. Now, um, you know, we're empty nesters, but I still I still really get a lot out of running away to write. And I think everybody and that's what I wrote about in the essay. I think everyone, especially, you know, we we know that our demographic is heavily women, but I think especially women need to take time away from their everyday lives and. Um, run away from home. No matter how you know, no matter how old you are, you're never, you're never too old to run away from home. <laughs> T-shirt. So, yes, definitely. Um, so here's what I'm wondering: If you run away from home to write, ladies, do you have a favorite destination, a spot where you find yourself both inspired and productive, or is there no. a spot? that you're still longing to run away to? Ooh. Ooh. Well, you know, I'll, I'll give you my answer to both, which is Paris. I'm always longing to go to Paris, and it's also a spot um, where I feel very creatively energized. Um, and 
I don't know, just very connected to what I'm writing. So I would say Paris, but also LA. I also find, um, oh, wow. yeah, like the creative muse. Just I didn't see that me. coming. Isn't that yeah. crazy? And you know what? I cannot write in coffee shops anywhere, but I can write in coffee shops in LA. Is that weird? I, it's very like, crazy. Yeah, I don't know. But you're yeah, waiting for Ma you're, because you're waiting for Matthew McConaughey to walk That out. is true. That is true. Mm -hmm. And no, sometimes he be, does. I think that would be me. Who are you waiting for? It's uh, I. Who would you be waiting for, Christine? I don't know. I don't know. Patrick Dempsey, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if I've. Mark Just Ruffalo. He's so yeah. nice. I'll be waiting for nice. Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. <laughs> and Mary Kay will be writing for. Would be waiting for Paul Rudd. We know. Yeah. We know. Yeah. We already know. <laughs> My <laughs> pretend boyfriend. Um, okay, so. Believe it or not, I have never run away to write before, um, which I need to do sometime. I feel like I'm always running away to tour, and so I don't want to be gone from home to run away and write, but I think it would like do me a lot of good if I did. Um, but I will say there's something about being in New York. I, it's not writing there, but it like inspires me like... It just gives me energy, and I think you know, going and doing those fun meetings that hopefully we'll get to do again one day, and um, just like being on the streets. And I've always really loved New York, and kind of felt like energized there, and like, like oh, you know. And I mean, I remember like walking by, you know, the publishing houses when I was young, and being like, oh, I'm gonna write for one of those one day. And so there's something about that that like gets me kind of jazzed up. For me, it's been a couple places from the sea to the mountains, but it always has changed the story and done me some good. And I can't wait to hear what Paula has to say about it because I know she has done the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. now let's talk about Paula really quick before we bring her on. She is the New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Wife, which has been published in 34 languages oh. and was on the New York Times list for 31 weeks and wow. has 2 million copies in print. Wow. She also wrote Circling the Sun and Love and Ruin, and her newest is When the Stars Go Dark. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love that cover. Yeah. Paula McLean is also the author of two collections of poetry, a memoir like Family, Growing Up in Other People's Houses, and a first novel, A Ticket to Ride, a recipient of fellowships from Yaddo, the McDowell Artist Colony, the Cleveland Arts Prize, the Ohio Arts Council, and the and the National Endowment for the Arts. She's, well, you know, not very impressive. Yeah, she's I know. Probably, yeah, I, yeah. She's, yeah, she's yeah. She's just looking for some those. stuff to say. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> she's just scraping the bottom of the barrel. I know. I, know. I was trying. Oh, no. oh my gosh! So Paula was born in California in 1965. After being abandoned by both parents, she and her two sisters became wards of the California court system, moving in and out of various foster homes for the next 14 years, which she has spoken and written so beautifully and movingly about. She received her MFA in poetry from the University of Michigan. She lives with her family in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where our Ron lives. Yeah, I didn't know she was <laughs> yeah. there. Cool. Her new book is an atmospheric novel of intertwined destinies and heart-wrenching suspense. So who can resist that? So Paula, Hi. come out. Come out from the green room. Hello. 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 Hi, Paula. Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to see you all. It's really nice. To be here, I admire you all, but I also just think you're lovely women and you're adding a lot to this conversation. You know, people who love books and keep them near their hearts, and it's important, you know, it's important, it's important Aww. what you're doing. And I know people are really feeling that so. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're honored you joined us, my friend. Absolutely. So to all of you out there who are watching, remember to put your questions in the comments on Facebook or on YouTube, and we're going to do our best to get to them. So Paula, the first thing I want you to do is tell us about the plot of When the Stars Go Dark. And then we're going to dive into the origin story and a whole bunch of other stuff, but tell yeah, us the absolutely. basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you need to know is that it's uh, set in the 1990s in Northern California in a town called Mendocino. And um, it begins with a missing persons detective who flees her home and uh, in a personal tragedy that we actually don't know a lot about until the end of the book. And where she goes is the place in the world that she finds 
most um, important to her that, that gives her a sense of home. She, like me, grew up in foster care, but Mendocino is the place that she calls home. She goes there in order to restore herself and to heal and to um, pick up the pieces of her life. But instead, the minute she arrives, she sees a poster for a missing girl. A local 15 year old girl has sort of vanished into thin air and she um, finds herself pulled into this case. And the ways that these stories connect essentially are things that really interest me about trauma and healing and survivorhood and, and destiny. So yeah, that's the, the plot of the book, plus a really great dog and a psychic and, <laughs> <laughs> and some amazing scenery. Good Lord. The, yeah, and, and because you. you're such a visual writer, the scenery is, you know, we're there, but thank it's you. such such a powerful book. So, you know, because we talk about it a lot, I'm endlessly fascinated by origin stories and where mm. books come from. Even yeah. Though it's hard to pin it down. There are certain mm -hmm. things that happen and you've had, you've written about three real women, you've written poetry, you've written a memoir, and this is a departure from all of that. This yeah. kind of took a hard right turn. So yeah. I want you to talk a little bit about the origin. I know you were walking your too cute for itself dog, Piper. <laughs> and she's in fact, perfect. And she just perked up. She's she like, is literally, she looks like a fake she dog. Knows I'm she's just saying. absolutely perfect. She might make a little cameo appearance later okay. in the show I as my, my big fat cat, Crowley, <laughs> um, who we just call Bubba because he's, um, yeah, because he looks like a Bubba. Anyway, um, I was actually in the middle of working on Love and Ruin. So Love and Ruin is a uh, told from the point of view of Martha Gellhorn, who was a uh, really important war correspondent. And she happens to have been the third wife of Ernest Hemingway. And the scene that I was working on the day that the idea for this book came to me is set in 1937 Madrid, you know? It's like Madrid surrounded, you know, on three sides by Franco's army and, you know, everyone's getting shelled every other second. And I was super immersed in her voice and her point of view and her perspective. And suddenly I took a dog walk to clear my head and um, and a character came literally out, out of the sky. Patty, you said, you know, hard right turn. It felt like that. It just felt like, you know, going to the movies, right? Completely just nothing that I ever think about, this missing persons detective who becomes involved in this case with a, you know, a vanished girl and there's a serial killer. Like who, who, this is not my life. This is, these are not the ideas that I have. And yet it had such authority when it came to me that I couldn't really stop thinking about it. Um, but I was in the middle of another book. And so I finished that book and it was still there, you know, percolating in the back of my mind. So I got super brave and told my agent about it one day. And I just assumed that she was going to say, girl, you have lost your cotton picking mind. Like, <laughs> no, you write historical fiction about women who actually live. So let's just go ahead and, and do that instead of this crazy thing. Um, instead, she said, that sounds amazing. Awesome. You should do it. And this is what I want to say about creativity and about support and how we can support each other. When somebody tells you their dream, just say, that sounds amazing. Yes. And sometimes I think it's our fear for each other, right? Like we're afraid or our kids come to us and say, I want to do X. And instead of saying, yes, go be an astronaut, we say, well, you know, Maybe accountant is more reasonable. <laughs> or how are you going to support yourself or any of these practical questions? Yeah. And the way we really can support each other's dreams is just say, go, 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 yeah. go. Don't look back. Just go. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's so important to have that support behind us, I think. I mean, like, like you said, yeah. just to have people behind us saying, well, you know, like this group is one of the reasons this group has been Absolutely. so wonderful is it's just, you know, a, a 
fountain of encouragement all the time, which is wonderful. Even when so, it's not necessary. Even when it's not, <laughs> even when it, even when it's self deserved, honestly. <laughs> but it, but it, it's nice. Um, so, Paula, you had an incredible profile in the New York Times titled "Paula McLean Wrote a Thriller," and this time it is personal. Um, and in that, you said that stories were the bridge that carried you out of foster care. Can you talk to us a little bit about what books mm -hmm. meant to you in that period of your life and whether you think that had something to do with why you wanted to become a writer? Oh my goodness, yes, no question. Absolutely no question. So I'm sure that you guys also had your lives saved by books in various ways because most yeah. writers I know will say books saved me. And I always take it seriously when I hear those words, um, regardless of what the backstory is, you kind of know that that there is one. Um, you know, by the time I was eight years old, I had been in so many different homes and felt such, um, such uncertainty about my future and so anxious about making new friends at school that I vowed to only make friends with librarians. <laughs> Which doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that make a hundred percent sense? And They're so, the good people. Yeah. Yeah. So I hid out in the library. I ate my lunch in the library. I made friends with librarians and I um, devoured books. I could read two and three books a day. Wow. And of course, you know, we say about books as if it's derogatory that we read for escape, as if yeah. that isn't sometimes the most marvelous trick yeah. in the world that we can read to escape our current environment. And you know, yeah. libraries are excellent for that now. Oh my God, do we need our libraries yeah. for people, you know, those people who really need a safe place and a, and a yeah. sense of really being grounded and, and yeah. stories can do this remarkable thing for us, can't they? Yeah. So if I read um, like Harry Potter pulling on the invisibility cloak, right? Oh I just, gosh, I just I love that. whole worlds around me and fell into these worlds and these were my best friends. And, you know, I read because I didn't know if I had a happy ending myself. And I read because I wanted something to hope for. And I read to disappear. And along the way, I also um, started to read like a writer, I think. Yeah. You know, and so that kind of total immersion of, and I love books, particularly hardcover books, because we open the pages and they sort of invite us to fall in. Yeah. And that's what books do. They just invite us to fall in. And, you know, nothing really works exactly that same way for me, except for writing that kind of absolute immersive experience that takes every part of me and knits it kind of into every part of the book. It's like a perfect magic carpet ride, a perfect hat trick. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. And I mean to do it until they wheel me away. That's amazing. Great answer. <laughs> and then I think about eight-year-old Paula in that library between yeah. foster homes. I just want to crawl through the screen. Oh, uh, and, and give her a hug. And I know. Go yeah, into the you could probably use a hug, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think we all could today. It's yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Consider everyone hugged. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Polly, you said in that same New York Times article, why not write the stories that matter? And then one of your themes is surviving the unsurvivable. Do you think that surviving the unsurvivable is a theme in all of your books? Oh yeah, although I wouldn't have known it from the very beginning. So in one way, my career looks really schizophrenic. I have two books of poetry, I have a memoir, I wrote a contemporary novel, I wrote these three historical novels, and now I have a suspense. Like, like lady, like pick a lane and stay in your lane. But to me, the through line of all of those books is really about resilience, like what it is. I don't know what it is to be fair, but I know what it feels like and I know what it is when I see it. Mm -hmm. And just how we overcome obstacles to discover ourselves is what I'm always looking for, right? Yes, and how we survive things that mean to kill us, <laughs> and, but then don't, right? And the people we have to survive 
in order to come out on the other side and do what we're meant to do, like what we're fated to do. Like that idea of destiny is always sort of driving me as well. And I, I wonder if it's part of the way that I grew up where there was so much just bad news, right? There was no way out. And so I started, you know, thinking, what if I'm meant for something bigger? What if this is not my life at all? I mean, that's, that's a storyteller's line, right? What if? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what if I'm meant to get out on the other side of this and tell about it? That's incredible. What if what if all this bad stuff is just the prologue? Yeah. Oh, Amen. 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 Okay, oh my first gosh. of all, I love that. I just got chills, Mary Kay. And my awesome. therapist says her favorite words in the English language are, and then one day. Yeah. Yes. 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 And then one day, because you could just like any right? Yeah. Any fable, Cinderella to, I mean, just on and on, Little Red Riding Hood, and then one day, yeah. right? Okay. And, then so one and then one day she rescued herself. Yes. yes. I, you know, words and I books. went to a, um, I went, to, when I was a newspaper reporter, I went to a um, popular culture convention um, and I went, sat in on a uh, panel discussion about the pop culture ramifications of the movie pretty woman oh. and until until i sat in on that it never occurred to me that pretty woman is about um cinderella and rapunzel and at the end of pretty woman um julia roberts says and then she rescued herself right yeah right so Mm -hmm. You know, Paula, um, your main character, Anna, in When Stars Go Dark, flees to the Northern California village of Mendocino to grieve. I'm wondering why Mendocino? Yeah. Have you ever been there? I mean, has I anybody... I, I don't think I have. Any of the friends um, been there? Okay, so it's three hours north of San Francisco. I grew up in California, but I grew up in a much less... Um, uh, picturesque, shall we say, <laughs> California. Um, I grew up in the Cleveland of California and it's <laughs> called Fresno in the Central Valley, which is hot as hell. And but it's home, like whatever's home to us is yeah, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely home. So, but three hours north of San Francisco um, is a little village that looks more like it belongs in Maine. And in fact, in Murder, She Wrote, which was um, this, you know, the set of Murder She Wrote is actually the town of Mendocino. I did and not I, know that. Mm -hmm. no, I didn't Murder She Wrote, either. exactly. So now I you guys can see it. Yeah. 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 On Jeopardy, we can. Yeah, oh, we'll know. Exactly. We um, it's this Victorian village, just cute as not. Victorian village, <laughs> white clapboard houses, gingerbread trim, picket fences, and on the the verge of this bluff, this super sheer cliff face, and then the roaring Pacific and all of it is surround. And by the way, it's tiny. A couple, you know, a couple hundred people live there, surrounded by ancient redwood forests, old growth redwood forests. And then um, the fog comes in. This eerie coastal fog that can come any time of day, in any moment, in any season and wrap you in this shroud of, you know, mystery and magic. And it's an extraordinary place, which I spent time in in my 20s. And that day that I took the dog walk and had this, you know, that whatever fairy dust of imagination, like these characters came to me knitted to that place. It did not seem at all um, random. Right. I just knew it had to be set there. And and lo and behold, it is it is set there. So once I did a book event and somebody stood up at the back, a live book event when, you know, I haven't done one yet, but I'm really looking forward to because anything can happen and anyone can say anything. And it's beautiful. But a woman stood up at the back and she said, not what are you writing next? She said, where are you taking us? 
Oh, I love that. Nice. So where are you taking us next? And I thought, that's right. And I think it hadn't ever been articulated to me in exactly that way, that place is my portal, you know, and, and, and every writer I think has one, like how do you enter a story as a character? Is it dialogue? Do you see the whole thing? Do you see the ending and write your way? Is it, is it one single character? Is it a voice? Sometimes for me, a voice is really important, but really the same immersive experience that I had as a kid, like with the invisibility cloak, I have to believe that I can see that place and if I can't see it, then honey, I cannot take you there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we talked before you came on, Paula, about running away to write. So when yeah. you were working on When Stars Go Dark, did you go to Mendocino to do research? Yes, I did. I ran away to Mendocino and I wasn't writing. Really? I was sometimes research for me is just breathing, right? Like yeah. Breathing the air of a place and getting yeah. the, the feel of it. What is it? feel like yeah. stand smell in like stand in those woods what does it smell like and sometimes i think as writers we can get too um wedded to the granular detail that we think is going to transport a reader to the place and it can be just like oh my god you know and i remember having this conversation with patty about surviving savannah which by the way is a beautiful book and i was lucky enough oh. to read it you know, when she was, and hear pages aloud when she was working on it. But, I did, I read you the first chapter. Oh, I know, but do you remember this, honey? You like read me the scene set on the ship and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's all fantastic. And yet I can tell how much research you did because yeah, yeah. you were trying to shove it into every moment of every yeah. sentence as a way, again, to get into the place. But to me, it's much, it's much more of an emotional yep. thing. And it's almost, it's super mysterious. Like we don't know how we get there. Sometimes one detail can do more work than a hundred correct details. Yeah, one true. like really heart-based detail that makes a reader go, yes. Yes. I know what it feels like to be there. Yeah, yes. that's such a good point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. Paula, each week we support an independent bookstore, and this week you chose Loganberry Books. Can you tell yeah. us why? Yeah, so Loganberry is this, it's the grooviest. I mean, I have a lot of independence, and as writers, as you guys yeah. know, it's really important to support these small booksellers who have brick and mortar stores, and it's almost, well, it's always out of a, it's an act of love. Nobody opens a bookstore because they want to get rich quick, right? <laughs> no, I mean, it's desperate. It's a desperate act to open a bookstore because, um, because it's a hard way to make a living. So it's really important to support them. But Loganberry, I love because it's in an old building with like creaky, soft, flo buttery floors and a fiction section that has I think 15 foot high ceilings and you have to get on a ladder, a really big ladder, a serious ladder to get to the top. And you could spend years in there and not touch every spine. And we just like to go in there and disappear on a rainy day. And it's, and it's just a wonderful place, used books, new books, rare books, dogs. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds so like a good place to disappear, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's actually a really great place. And a local writer, uh, a girlfriend of mine, who was the first writer friend that I made in Cleveland, Sarah Willis, she has a beautiful book called Some Things That Stay. If you don't know it, it's fantastic. Um, she works there as a bookseller. She worked there as a bookseller because she likes to be around books. Who doesn't, right? Didn't you always want to be a librarian or, yeah. right? Piper, if you bark, yeah. I'm going to kick you. Now, come on over. <laughs> Hang on, y'all. Let's see. Let's see if she'll make an appearance. Come here, Piper. Come here. Oh, hi, baby. Aunt Patty's here. Hi, hi Piper. Well, we'll see. <laughs> and now she's gone. And now she's gone. We'll see. If she barks, I'm sorry. There's nobody to yell at. There's no child home. Sometimes I I um I bribe my children to take the dog into their rooms while I'm doing events. Um, you know, 
And sometimes they ask me for more money because they're tired of me by now. <laughs> That's called an extortion. We're never, we're never I'm a single it. parent, which also means that I'm a single dog parent. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, your bookstore sounds amazing. And just for everyone out there, Logan Berry has an inventory of more than 100,000 volumes, including ours. And you can get 10% off at Logan Berry Books this week on When the Stars Go Dark and on new and recent titles from all of us with a special link on our Facebook page under announcements. Paula, before we jump in, because there's all these live questions coming in, you know, I always make you do this. I want you to talk about when you were in Mendocino and you saw the time in the maiden on the rooftop and how, oh. how I, don't know. I have a, I have so a beautiful and it just worked its way into that. There it is. Okay. Oh. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so this mm -hmm. is um, a carving that's on this, you know, the, the, of an actual chapel that was uh, constructed in 1865. And this is a statue of Father Time and this and this maiden. But all you have to do is sort of like look a little bit closer to see just how creepy it is. It is creepy. Just how creepy it is. Because he's like number one, he's braiding her hair. Ew. <laughs> Ew, Ew. Like braiding her hair, and then there are all these other details. There's a there's a an urn. There's an acacia bow. There's an hourglass, and then this scythe. And you know, Father Time is also is also death. So here we have death braiding the hair of this mysterious maiden, and this um, carving is visible from every corner of Mendocino. And so I just stared at it, and I thought, I wonder what this means. And so I did a little, you know, Google dive and all the articles basically turned up the fact that nobody really knows what it means. It's like a mystery in plain sight. And I thought, okay, so there's a metaphor, right? And so that's something that's braided all the way through the book, not just the physical carving and what my character, you know, who grows up in this town from the age of 10, like steeped in the unsolvable nature of this thing which is braided into our psyche as a mystery right not now, knowing is that what a it scroll means. is that a scroll she's holding so this is you know and if um you know it's it's on the it used to be a masonic lodge now it is a credit union <laughs> <laughs> so that in fact is a column that has broken in half oh wow. yeah so it's a, it's a sundered it's a sundered column. Oh. Yeah. And it's and the, the story that's being told in the carving is something that's important to Masonic rituals. But what I liked about it, knowing nothing about Masonry and actually not wanting to know anything about Masonry because the mystery is the more interesting thing. Yeah. Right? That is why I always want to talk about that because I remember when you saw it and how it was almost a mirror or an echo of the mystery Anna was going to have to solve and yeah. these unsolvable things in our life and how right. one in this crazy world where we it's hard to say where a book came from sometimes it's something like a really mysterious yeah carving and all yeah. of a sudden your mind is making connections and moving towards a different kind yeah. of story. So, so I think I think a bunch of things, but I also think this. So there I was. I on think a bunch of things. I think a bunch <laughs> of things all at once, usually. Because <laughs> all writers do. But, you know, the on the dog walk that day, these characters came and I knew the setting, but I didn't know where it would take me. Because we yeah. never do. We really just buy a ticket. <laughs> we just buy a ticket and we get on the ride. And hopefully we have the the boldness and the and the surrender, sort of in equal parts, to just ride this ride and see where it takes us. And I had no idea that after a, a dozen years of writing historical fiction about women who actually lived, that the first time I chose 
a fictional character that she would be closer to me, right? Than anything I could ever imagine and closer to me than, you know, the version of myself that I wrote about in my own memoir. Like, how does that happen, right? So, you know, so when I was working on her backstory, suddenly I thought, and it wasn't right away, it took several drafts until it occurred to me that the story I was actually telling was about how we survive the unsurvivable, Christy. Like how we survive the unsurvivable and that Anna, as someone who grew up in foster care, is going to be um, acutely aware of pain. So she wears her own pain, she carries it with her, right? It makes her super sensitive to the stories of others, particularly the traumatic stories of others. And it's exactly how she's lived her life that helps her, that leads her to find this girl and helps her not save the girl, but understand how we are saved. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And just think what you just said about the character and how she helped solve the mystery of this missing girl from what's inside of her. It's you and what's inside of you that does the story. It's, you did a- Exactly, the whole meta, meta thing. You did, you right? did the mirror, yeah. mirror, the mirror. The mirror, the mirror. mirror, exactly. Yeah. Whatever leads Anna to Cameron, this is missing girl you. is the thing that yeah. led me to both of them. Ooh. And the way I know, it gets good the way that we understand each other. But I think this is what we're always doing yeah. as writers. And it doesn't matter who we're writing about. It's all these little, it's like fortune cookies, right? It's just yeah. that little slip of paper that's hidden in the cookie. That yeah. is that thing that is true, 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 true. Right. And maybe yeah. somebody knows you really well and reads your book and says, oh my God, I can't believe you told that story. <laughs> Because nobody knows because it's a secret. You know, it's like our deep down. Sometimes we don't even know it. And the character shows it. Oh, sometimes. Sometimes sometimes. that's true. I mean, I was working on The Paris Wife and my marriage was failing. But I didn't, I was hiding that truth from myself. But I was writing about a marriage that was falling apart. And so all of the, you know, women, you know, who read my book and bawl their eyes out on airplanes and then write me and tell me about it. It's because they're, you know, because they sense the the truth in those scenes. I didn't even know I was writing the truth. It sneaks in, it sneaks in. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. So we have an amazing community and they love to ask questions. So yeah, Christy Woodson Harvey, would you take us away, grab a couple of the live Ooh, questions? Yeah. Cause I could keep asking her questions, but. Yes, <laughs> me too. Well, so I have to start with more of a compliment than a question from Bonnie Miller, who says she could listen to Paula talk forever. Her description and her conversation is so beautiful. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, We actually have a lot of people asking about your childhood and what books inspired you during your childhood, which I think is an interesting. Yeah, that's really sweet. So I play a game sometimes. I'm going to do it with you all just super, super quick, and then I'm going to answer the question. (laughs) And the game, Patty's played this game with me, I think. The game is um, name that book, your favorite book as a kid, and then think about what it, just to yourself, like what it's about, you know, like sort of at the core, what it's about. So, you know, mine was maybe a tree grows in Brooklyn. Oh, that's crazy. Crazy. That's yeah, crazy. Of course, I know, right? Or maybe even um, Watership Down, you know? Mm. Um, and then to think about the book that you uh, were embarrassed to admit that you read in high school. <laughs> and then to think about what that book is about. And for me, that book is probably Flowers in the Attic. It's in the Attic. Right, Flowers in the Attic, <laughs> which is really about how we survive unsurvivable things. And it's about resilience mm-hmm. and all this stuff, right? And yeah. then the, the book that you've read, that you read, you know, as an adult, that really feels like it's like the book of your heart. And and recently mm-hmm. that book for me is 
My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout, which really is about that, about resilience and what we survive and how, what we carry forward with us after through the surviving. Um, that That's your language, Patty Callahan. That was going to say, that, there we go. You, you didn't yeah. know. Yeah. So just play that game with yourself every once in a while. You know, my favorite line in My Name is Lucy Barton is um, Lucy wants to be a writer and her first writer writer teacher tells her, don't ever worry about story. We only get we one. one. Oh, you know? yeah. Everyone only gets one. You only have your one story and you might write about it from 100 different vectors, but yeah. you're still going to arrive at that at that one story. That so, was actually yeah. one of our questions for you and we didn't even have to ask it. So isn't that interesting? There you go. Do you believe that everyone only has one story? That's the question. Yeah, that's awesome. I do believe that we're always sifting through the same earth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like we yeah. get, or you get this plot of earth and it's the stuff, it's our stuff. It's the stuff we're fascinated by. What I didn't know was that this book was going to pitch me in a, in a kind of perfect way at my own obsessions that I found this character who could really allow me to, you know, I just gave her everything at a certain point. I gave her my childhood in foster care. I gave her my obsession with trauma and healing. I gave her a dog I love that I've met in real life, you know, and I gave her one of my favorite places in the world. I gave her nature as medicine. Wow. And um, yeah, and then I let her talk. That's amazing. Do you ever notice? Oh, sorry. No, go go ahead. Ahead. Do you ever notice like little these little strings that run from one story to the next that you write? Like even if they're extreme, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this because you've written things that are extremely different from each other. But even like yeah. I'm working on Christmas and Peachtree Bluff and The Wedding Veil right now, they could not be more different. Like they could yeah. not be more different. And there are these little threads that I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, I'm writing about the same thing in both of these. This is yeah, really that's, because that's you. Yeah. Yeah, it's really yeah, interesting. That's because the universe. That's, that's the universe, wow. universe clearing its throat. It's our soil. It's our compost yeah. pile. It's yeah. like this whole Paula, thing. we got have so many questions. Maybe you will go in afterwards to the Friends in Fiction Facebook sure. page and yeah. answer some of those questions because people want to know what you're reading. I they want to know. Yeah. Yeah. They want to know what your favorite genre to write is and which genre you're going to take us to next. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot. We want to be great really, to know. I mean, yeah. I want to know those things too. <laughs> every <laughs> week, every week, one of our favorite parts of the show is receiving a writing tip. And on your Instagram, you have given a really a big gift to your followers, which is Writers Monday, where you answered writing questions from your readers. For anybody out there watching tonight, would you go out there and find those posts? It's a treasure trope. But tonight, maybe share, maybe share a writing trip with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, you could look for me on Instagram. It's not always on a Monday. You know why? Because I never know what day it is. Like all of you guys. Yes, I will drink to that. Um, it's we only know when it's Wednesday. I'm <laughs> sorry. And then only barely. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my God, I know. Um, oh my God. It's a feature I've been calling Ask Me Anything. And so, questions from readers throughout the years. Again, it's like QA, right? It's my favorite part of any event is the QA. Because yeah. that's the part that you don't know what's going to happen. I already know what I'm going to say. But then yeah. somebody asks you a question and suddenly it gets you to think about a different part of your experience or, or even what your wisdom is. So, I was even thinking about it. Patty said to me, yesterday. Oh, by the way, we're going to ask you about a writer's tip. I'm like, a writer's tip? Like, what do I know about writing? And it's like a little nugget. And then I was thinking about, <laughs> no, I know. I was thinking about, oh, stop laughing. <laughs> we can't. We can't. I was thinking about I was thinking about busyness and a way the way that writers <coughs> often come to me and ask me how do you make time? Yeah. How do you make time to write? And the fact of the matter is, like you don't. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Like you do not, you will never live a life where you have enough time to write. Yeah. That life does not yeah. exist. And when I'm not writing, I'm super busy. And when I am writing, I'm even more busy. Mm -hmm. But the time does not exist. We're not going to suddenly magically get to that clearing in the forest mm -hmm. that invites us to sit down and finally write the book that we're meant to yeah. write. I think that it, I don't know, I'm, I'm inviting you to imagine a world where you took the time yeah. and used it as that clearing in the woods as a gift that you give yourself because you don't have time to write yeah like, like what if you simply said i will never have the time and i have to make it and it's just for me and it's the most precious thing i have so and i'm going to sit down right here and i'm just gonna yeah. i'm gonna make it like that is that's it right it's that yeah. it's that clearing in the chaos the chaos will never get quieter yeah. Don't you guys play that game with yourself? I just have to get off tour, or I just have to yes. get this yes. or I just oh, get it now. Have to lunch, it now. and then yeah. 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 it's going to be fine. But then it's not. It's not. It's never right? fine. It never Somebody is. Get married, or we have this weekend, and then never it's going to be fine. Yeah. But no, yeah. it's no, never, never ever, home. ever. Yeah, you're totally right, uh, Paula. Yeah. Another thing that we always like to ask. Um, our guests every week is if they have something they're reading lately or something they've read recently that they love. Do you have a book recommendation you can give us? I do. And in fact, this is so fun, y'all. You're going to, I hope you're going to smile, but um, I've been reorganizing my bookcases because I have too many damn books, <laughs> like too many damn books and they keep proliferating like mushrooms. And so I was trying to give stuff away and looking at older titles. And I picked up this little book, Shirley Jackson, we oh have my God. always Gosh. lived in the castle, which was published in 1963. Uh, oh, my goodness. Wow. I can remember reading so here's, that. And look how little it is. It's just a snack. Wow. It's just a snack. Um, but I picked it up, and I just, I was trying to decide whether or not I could throw it away, because I've had it, oh, for a really long time. And I read five pages, and then I read 10 pages, and then I read 20 pages, and then I read 30 oh, pages awesome. because it is just so awesome. brilliant. And if you've not read Shirley Jackson, she wrote the short story, The Lottery. The Lottery. That we all had to read yeah. Lottery. Yeah. Yeah. Class in ninth grade, and also <laughs> mm -hmm, The Haunting at Hill House. And mm -hmm. so she's a, you know, a thriller writer, a suspense writer. But if you just read, I think what is really capturing me about this book is the absolute authority and particularity of the voice. And you think about what is suspense? Like we're all writing suspense, aren't we? Because yeah. suspense just means we have to turn the page. Yeah, yeah. Right? Point. We have to turn the page and there's just something about the eeriness uh, and particularity, the, the just the detail of the voice and the apps, the engine of the voice that sets up this mystery from page one that I just thought, you know, this doesn't sound like anything anyone's writing today. And, awesome. and I just love it. I just love it. So I love when you throw back something throwback. I know. Yeah. We should throwback. start like a throwback Thursday. Throwback Thursday. your own show. Honey, we'll let you be in charge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Add that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, did, I just did I just accidentally volunteer for something? It's like when you're like, you know what? Our kids should go on a field trip. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Real quick, I want to recommend a book called The Last Commandment by Scott Shepard. And speaking of thrillers, it is a debut thriller out next wow. week. And at, wait, it was out yesterday um, with endorsements oh, yeah. from yeah. one of yeah, it was out yesterday. And it has an endorsement from one of our friends and fiction favorites, Karen Slaughter. And so it's getting tons of buzz. And he's a Hollywood TV writer for Miami Vice, Quantum Leap. And it's the first in a series with a mm. Scotland Yard detective. Ooh, so, wow. Great. Absolutely. Anyone else? No, I think... Um... We have to talk about podcasts, Patty. All right, Paula, don't leave because we have a couple of more announcements, but we have another question for you. But okay. first, we want to remind all of you out there to check out our Friends and Fiction Writer's Block podcasts. 
We'll always post links under announcements each time a new one comes out. It is with our favorite librarian, Ron Block. It is so much fun and it is totally different from the show and it comes out every single Friday. We love Ron Block. So Ron Block. That's very amazing You're librarians. Yeah. 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 Well, last week, Patty and Ron talked to Susan Cushman and Lisa Patton in our series called Origin Stories about their novels, um, John and Mary Margaret and Rush, which are both set at the University of Mississippi in different decades. And this week, Ron talks to book clubs with MJ Rose and Pauline, is it Hubert? Hubert. Hubert. You bear. And you know what else? We have been nominated for not one, but two People's Choice Awards, and we Yay. want to win, you Yay. guys. <laughs> so um, we made some snazzy uh, how-to guides on our um, our Facebook page under announcements, and it takes like less than a minute to vote for us. So we would really appreciate your vote. Hashtag winning. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's not an honor to be nominated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that you guys are really competitive and you're like, we're going to win. Number two like to is win. the worst win. loser. <laughs> So just a reminder about our Friends in Fiction official book club hosted by our friends Lisa Harrison, who I got to give a big hug to last night, That's and awesome. Brenda Gardner, who I think I'm going to get to see later this week. It is growing like mad. It's a separate page, and we would love to have you join us over there to talk about books in depth. So this coming Monday, July 19th, they'll be talking to Mary Alice about the summer of Lost and Found. And then on Friday, the 23rd, I believe that's Friday, um, and next oh. Friday, they will have a virtual party to celebrate their one year anniversary, which is so exciting. It it's gonna fun. be so much fun. Am I mixing updates? I think it is the 23rd. And then okay. I will join them on October 16th. No, to talk August. About the August 16th. Of I, you if know, that would be listen, I've been driving since 7.30 this morning. I have not paused. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't no, even know what is, what is today? What is time? I, I should not August, have even given you that part. <laughs> August 16th to talk about the forest of vanishing stars. <laughs> talk about the ultimate volunteering yourself. Was it, was it Lisa or Brenda that were like, you guys should have a book club. And someone was like, great, you should start it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, With all your extra time. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. The time we make, the time we take. That's exactly yes. right. Um, and in the time that you make this week, if you have not checked out our merch, it's there. It's on our website, friendsandfiction.com. Um, you can buy it through Oxford Exchange, and it's fantastic. But even more important, don't forget to check out that that Friends in Fiction um, signed first edition subscription, A Winter Wonderland of Books with our friends at Nantucket Books Partners. And speaking of Nantucket, I know we <laughs> wish we could Nantucket. all go in person and Paul you with going us. At the end of this month. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> How You're gonna have to Let's send us show up in real life. Yeah, oh, what would you do? You Turn us away? away? Come on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Paula, you're coming with. So Sounds we good. are going to be on the friend at the friends at the man. Okay, I'm starting over. We are going to be at the I, man I <laughs> You passed on the blah, blah, blah. We're Sorry. going to be at the Nantucket Book Festival next week. It is virtual, so everyone can come. July 20th at 7 p.m. There will be games and prizes and giveaways, original stories, and loads of laughs as Tim turns the table on us and plays host for the night. Mm -hmm. We have also each written a very short story about Nantucket. There once was a man. No, from... no, 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 yeah, we agree. We're not going to tell that story. Come on, Patty, come on. But if you want to attend and see what the stories really are about, the event is free and open to all, but you have to register in order to get the link to attend. So the sign up is on the Nantucket Book Festival website, and we do hope you'll join us because it's the only place you can hear these crazy stories that we've written. Yes. Next week, Join us right here at 7 p.m. with Vanessa Riley to talk about her new novel, Island Queen. It's historic fiction. And then the following week, we'll be here with a little lady we call Christina Baker Klein oh. and her novel, The Exiles. And if you are ever wondering about our schedule, it is always on the Friends and Fiction website, as well as the sidebar of events on our Friends and Fiction Facebook page. 
Okay, Paula, we didn't get to talk about it and I wanna talk about it, your poetry, <laughs> which oh. is always alive in your prose. And awesome. you're also a memoirist and Thank a novelist. I wanna talk about how they overlap or don't overlap and do mm. you, what does the difference feel like even in your body when you're doing these mm. very different things? That's a great question. You surprised me. I didn't know you were going to ask that. Oh, um, good. I love surprising. <laughs> I know. So remember how I said just a second ago that Q and A's are my favorite because we don't really know what's going to happen or what somebody's going to ask. And once somebody said, "Do you still write poetry?" and I said, "I do still write poetry, except I do it in my novels." And it was sort of a ah. joke, right? But I, I think it's. I think it's for reals. I think that how I um, love words and 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 use them to describe experience and and seen and felt experience is in me, kind of in my spleen. You know, it's like all the way. It's like all the way in it. I can only do that, right? I can only do it exactly the way that I do it, I sometimes joke that I only have two, I have two superpowers. I can describe things and I can make pie, you know? <laughs> and then I know, and then Patty and I became friends with a woman who could really make pie. And now I say, okay, I only have the one thing. I can just- it's just hilarious. Describe things. I love words and I love um, imagery yeah. and the power of the image to carry human experience. It's like what, it's why we read. We read to know we're human. We read yes. to know why we're here. And we write for the same reason, so. And part it. of part of reading and the being allowed to read um, and to have ownership of books is bookstores, mm. so. We want to encourage all of you to go out and grab Paula's When the Stars Go Dark, yeah. preferably from our bookseller of the week, Loganberry Books. Paula, thank you so much for sharing your life and your inspiration for us. Absolutely. And for telling us about your journey to California and your process. It's really been my pleasure. I think you guys are amazing. Think right back at you. Amazing. Me. Right okay. back at you. I wish I could hug you in real life. Wouldn't that be yeah. great? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Come come visit me in Cleveland, I sort of want to say, and you guys will say no, but sometimes no. it happens. No, 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 we say yes. I love, yes, I love Cleveland. Cleveland. Yes. Cleveland rocks. Mm -hmm. Cleveland rocks, baby. Pop Cleveland. Here. We're here, so come visit. Yeah. We're like planning this. on it. All okay. right, I love. Thank bye. you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, folks, we will see. That was so powerful. We will see yeah, you in a minute great. at the Story yeah. Point after show. So come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Vanessa Riley. And don't forget to check out our winter subscription box, and we'll tell you so much more about it as time goes on. But right now, we'll see you at the Story Point Sip and Stay after show. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our Story Point Sip and Stay After Show, the wine that loves stories as much as we do with a woman winemaker who talks about things like what's wine without a story. We say, what is anything without a story? <laughs> exactly. This is the summer of story point. If you haven't seen our uncorking the weekend videos, go check it out on Instagram. Oh, hmm. you say you want to know where do you buy story point? I so it. you can drink with us. Yeah. You can yes. drink with us. Um, here is how you find out about that. You go to Story Point Wine Finder Tool, go to the storypointwines.com to their website, 
and then look for the story point wine finder tool and that's where you find online retailers or search for a local store or restaurant near you hmm. awesome sounds easy enough to me awesome. so Kristen, so how are you hanging are are you, yes, that are you, how are you hanging I, are you just like ready I'm to collapse like, Yes, and I still have a 9 p.m. virtual. It's with Christina McMorris, so it will be delightful because she's always delightful. Oh, but I'm like, awesome. who, how, wh what was I thinking when I said, yeah, I think I'll have a day where I get up at 7, no, I'm sorry, get up at 6, you know, get myself ready, leave my hotel at 7.30 in Atlanta, drive to Spartanburg, do a luncheon, do a magazine photo shoot and interview, do a cocktail party, do Friends in Fiction, and then um, a 9 p.m. virtual. So I guess okay, I forgot. Okay, I have I to go to bed. Like, oh my gosh. No, I, I actually, I think virtuals, like I being on tour and doing virtuals added such an entirely new dimension yes. to the exhaustion of it's, being on tour. Because instead of coming back going. and like collapsing in your bed. Yeah. You, you come back and turn on your computer. computer. Yeah, you're and, just. And further complicating it, I have not um, actually eaten really since breakfast. I had a no. couple nibbles at lunch. No, but um, they served they served spinach spinach quiche, which looked delicious. But they served it before I spoke. And what would have happened to my mouth if I'd eaten spinach yeah, quiche? Oh, I, I, think we should, I think we should tell everybody the reality of book tour, which is <laughs> it this sounds, is dinner. This is it what I'm sounds so oh, glamorous, God. right? It's You're starving and exhausted <laughs> and you have red hats for dinner because it's they have like, it. No, I'm sorry. I forgot the second course. This is different. <laughs> Y'all, I remember this one time, like being in a hotel room and it had a microwave and I was I had like a real event and then a virtual right after. And I went to the like grocery store and grab this like freezer burrito and i was sitting in this like sad hotel room eating this sad freezer burrito and I was like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me what am i doing very bad <laughs> and, and we want, we is actually want, worse than my sad burrito you know we don't want people I to just, think we don't you know. love we, we do, do love book tour. And oh my gosh, really we love it. So oh my much. god, I've had such a wonderful time. It's just you know my stomach's been talking to me for the last hour. Like please. we really feel so grateful that we yeah. get to do yeah. it. Yeah. Not everybody gets to go out on tour. We love to meet readers, we do. but we do. I think we should yeah. all share like our saddest <laughs> book <laughs> tour stories. It's, oh. it's, it's this one day I didn't eat until 8.08 PM. And then I broke into my food at the end of Friends of Fiction. That's my saddest book tour story. It's, but the funny thing about book tour is like one day you were like, I am Lying. the most glamorous freaking person yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Like yeah. I just had this gorgeous event. I'm at this swanky yeah. hotel. And yeah. then the next night you're like, Oh my God, is that a roach and water ring on the ceiling? And I haven't had food in four days. Like what's happening? And your car looks like a blue Smurf and then it yeah. overheats. And then you get in a fender bender and you're lost. Yeah. 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 One Always time I was, I was going to, um, I was going up to the Jersey shore. So I flew from wherever I was in the South and I flew into someplace else. And I picked up a rental car and I got to my motel on the way to the Jersey shore. And literally when I was walking through the hotel lobby with my little roller bag, <laughs> everyone hanging out there, I absolutely know was on early release from prison. <laughs> Seriously, they all had ankle bracelets. Uh, their parole oh God, officers were in the parking lot. <laughs> I, oh I'm making a note, y'all, for whenever if we have a just us episode. <laughs> so that because I know Kristen needs to go, but we need to talk about like stories from the road. I have like five yes. mental car stories that I could tell right now. So let's let's do that. Mm -hmm. Also, okay. I would love for us to talk about not tonight because I don't want to see Kristen pass out on the screen. But yeah, um, like two seconds away from happening. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about the three books that Paula talked about. Yeah. You know, the yeah. favorite book of childhood, yeah. your favorite yeah. embarrassing book, 
And then I think that's really interesting. I have so many yeah. notes that I took tonight. It's really amazing. Yeah, she was great. She was great. She's amazing. That was yeah. just a powerful. She's an amazing really about what my book is that I was embarrassed about. Um, mm -hmm. In high, was it that what you were embarrassed about reading? It was your favorite in high school. Like the, yeah. in, you know, as a teenager or whatever, a book you didn't want to tell anybody you Oh, loved. mine was probably Forever Amber. Uh, mm. I don't remember being embarrassed about it. I anything. have to think about it. I well, I was, I, I was raised Catholic and Forever Amber was pretty Me lusty. Too. Yeah. yeah. Lusty. That's a good mm -hmm. word. Lusty. Mm -hmm. That's funny. All well, right, ladies. Paul is amazing. And I wish she was great. in real life. I met her at the same time I met you, Patty. We met oh, on the same awesome. day. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, great. we met on the same day in Texas. So I know. Look at us now. Exactly. How far we've come. <laughs> well, ladies, I've got to go eat. I'm so sorry. So sorry to be at the party. Love you. Be careful out there on the road. Hey, wait for all of you who are still hanging around. Mary Kay and Kristen and I will be together on Sunday, yes. and maybe so we'll find a flat Christy to carry. Oh, I know. Oh my God, it's Maybe probably too late to make a Christy. Not only is it so mean, but it's also my birthday weekend and y'all are hanging out without me. No, oh it's your birthday weekend. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Christy. Happy so birthday. Mine is coming up. Let's not out just talk about her. I have a birthday coming up too. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> not just it's not just about you. I well, it's oh just about me because this is my birthday week. It can be yours when it's your birthday week. Oh, <laughs> I want a lemonade pie for my birthday. Do you think Paula would make me one? Can, yes. And she's can so I, Can good I at also it. just say I didn't get a birthday week celebration because it happened to be some lady releasing a book called The Newcomer that week? Sure. Yeah. That's truth. Exactly. Fucking I know. Are <laughs> we allowed to say that? I did. We have made it's it through so, so many episodes. episodes. We have made it through 78 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you know what? Too late, Sean, Sean. Too late. Sean just put beep instead of bleep. So that's bleep. <laughs> Sean, it's not beep. It's bleep. Put beep, the L in beep. there. It's bleep. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, you know, now you know. There you go. There you go. All right. I'm going to go eat. All right. Okay, Good night, you guys. Don't have fun. I'll miss y'all. I'm sad. Well, Bye, guys. Too. Well, Good night, everyone.